شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شر أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Well, the hadith that we studied last week, the 10th hadith of Abu Huraira, who's going to mention some of the benefits that we studied? <coughs> it's a means and a reason, naam. For a person whose food is haram, drink is halal, it's a means for their dua not to be accepted. Their, their dua may be accepted, lakin. It is certainly a means for their dua not to be accepted. Taib. Naam. Excellent. So the people have been create have been created for the commandments of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, just like the prophets. And there's no time that that commandment runs out. The only time that commandment runs out is when a person dies and they go on to the akhirah. <laughs> Some of the scholars derive from the, uh, the hadith that one of the names of Allah Jalla wa'ala is a tayyib Excellent. Allah only accepts good in what? In speech and in action and in in belief and in the heart. Naam. And the opposite to that is what? Naam. Doesn't accept anything that is filthy. Such as innovations, such as uh, shirk, associated partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and sins. Tayyib. What are some of the etiquettes of making dua? Ikhlas, humility, certainty, not being hasty. Now, one second. Ikhlas, doing it for Allah jalla wa ala's sake. Humility, being humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when making that dua. Certainty of what? That your dua will be accepted, inshallah, in one way or another. And in what ways did the Messenger وسلم, say that the dua of the Muslim will be accepted? Three ways, one of three ways. No. Allah delays it for him. Either that Allah Jalla delays it for him and rewards him with it for on the day of Qiyamah. It is answered immediately and it is whatever a person asks for. Naam, a harm or a trial or tribulation is removed And from the mawani' or the things that prevent One's dua from being accepted is what? The hadith no. The hadith itself One of the mawani' or the preventions of dua being accepted is what? Haram, haram A person indulging in haram Food and drink <coughs> طيب, The next hadith, the 11th hadith uh, by Hassan Leave that which you know for that which you do not know. Leave that which you are certain of for that which you are not certain of. There's a, f- a fiqh principle that the scholars derive from this. What is it? Naam, it's true. You're right. It shows generality. It shows generality. More of a, <coughs> more of a principle. Certainty is not removed by doubt And that can be applied in many different chapters Who can tell me what Hassan Sahihun means And also is there a problem with this wording As it is, as it stands so, there's, there's Two, <coughs> two what? Like, is there a problem, and why is there a problem in the first place? You're right. Okay. 
There's not a problem with two. Okay, go on. So explain it. Chains two chains of narration for the same hadith. One is Sahih and one is Hadith. Excellent. One is Sahih and one is Hadith. Uh, Hassan. And the other one is that uh, Imam Tirmidhi forgot to put the O because he was unsure. And so, mm. Hassan said. Yeah, so the hadith says either Sahih or Hassan. And the reason why we have to bring that sort of interpretation is because what? Why do we have to actually mention that? Uh, there's only three types of hadith. Excellent. The, no, excellent. So there's only three types of a hadith. In the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when we're looking at it as a general, from a general perspective, there are three types. There's Sahih, which is authentic. There's Hasan, which is also authentic, but it's graded good. And there's Da'if. So the problem we have here is Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah has said that this hadith is authentic and it is good. Yani, same meaning. طيب. So the hadith that we're going to start from today is hadith number 13. Fadl. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma barik fi shaykhina wa ahfadhu wa arfa' qadarahu wa lil muslimina ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Qala al-mu'allifu rahimahullah. Al-hadith al-thalitha ashar. عن أبي حمزة عن أبي حمزة أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عن خادم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه رواه البخاري ومسلم طيب جزاك الله خير طيب so this hadith is narrated by أبي حمزة أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه who served the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So Anas lived in Medina, and when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated to Medina, his mother wanted to uh, give a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. However, she did not have anything to give uh, financially. So what she done was she asked, she said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Anas would help him. Anas would be his helper. So Khatim here is not a slave, lakin. Anas was the helper of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That's why Anas preserved a lot of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Radiallahu anhu He preserved a lot of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Because he spent 10 years with him And Anas bin Malik Radiallahu anhu He mentions about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That he served him for 10 years And not on one occasion did he have a go at him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did not have a go at Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu. So Anas says, he did not say to me for something I did not do, why didn't you do it? And he did not say to me for something I did, why did you do it? And that shows the beautiful manners of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a lot of dua, or made dua for Anas, for him to be wealthy and for him to have offspring, uh, many offspring and then he had that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or he had that radiallahu anhu Allah jalla wa ala granted him that that's why Anas radiallahu anhu was from the companions that lived that lived uh, long it is said that he passed a hundred tayyib also what we see from there is that the wisdom of the mother of Anas radiallahu anha the mother of Anas the fact that she took her son to serve a prophet from the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not every day that you're going to get the opportunity to serve a prophet from the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lakin, the mother of Anas radiallahu anha, she took advantage of this and she took her son to help the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in return becoming from the Companions who served the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who fought alongside the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who spread, who preserved the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and spread the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this shows, as a benefit, that women have a major role to play in the community. Women have a major role to play in the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you look at many of the great imams of Islam, they were raised by their mothers. Anas, uh, Malik ibn Anas radiallahu anhu wa rahimahullah, Imam Dar al-Hijrah, the Imam of Medina, 
who has his own madhab, the madhab of the Malikiya. He was raised by his mother and she would send him to the masjid to learn etiquettes of knowledge before even knowledge. Also Imam Ahmad radiallahu anhu rahimahullah. His mother went far and beyond in order for Ahmad to seek knowledge and to become the imam that he became. Also the, imam of, the mother of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. The, imam of, the mother of Imam Shafi'i. So all of these great imams who now have their own madhab, who have had their own madhab for over a thousand years in which every part of the Muslim ummah ascribes themselves, affiliates themselves with one of these madhabs. You will find in every part of the world where you find Muslims that they either say we are Malikis, we are Shafi'is, we are Hanafis or we are Hanbalis. So these three Imams, rahmatullahi alayhim, they were raised by their mothers alone. This shows that sisters have got a major role to play in rectifying the Ummah. That's why some of the Salafs used to say, be merciful to women. They are half of the Ummah and they give birth to the other half of the Ummah. That's why it's important that women learn and attend classes because the first madrasa that the child enters into and graduates from is the what? The mother. Why? Because the mother is in the home. And if the mother is at home, she is able to teach the children that which the father cannot teach. That which he cannot teach them. Even if he's an alim, if he's an imam, even if he's an alim and he's an imam of a masjid and so on and so forth, his wife has access to the children 90% of the time. Therefore, if the children are spending time, 90% of their time with a person who has understanding of the religion of Allah, who has knowledge, then it's important that, uh, that she has knowledge in order to be able to teach these children. And women have a big influence in how the household is run. People think, especially when you're young, people think that the man is the head of the household. Like the woman is the head of the household in reality. So if you think that... Uh, <laughs> like a lot, a, lot of, a lot of shabab, when they're getting married, they think that they have to be rough and tough in the household. Show her who's boss and so on and so forth. Like, and it's not about showing them who's boss. It's about... Raising a home upon Tawheed and Sunnah, upon the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they are the same team. And if the woman is rectified in the household, then the household can be rectified. If the woman is a righteous woman, then the house can be a righteous, the home can be a righteous place and a blissful place. So it all goes around the women, it all goes around the wife, the mother. If the father, however, is not a righteous person, the home can still be a righteous place, more often than not. So that was, <coughs> in there we see, the, whim, the wisdom of an, the mother of Anas radiallahu anhu. So he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسي One of you will not truly believe. One of you will not truly believe and his iman will not be complete unless... And until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. This hadith, it shows us and it tells us that we should love for our Muslim brother that which we love for ourselves. In another narration, min al-khayri, from goodness. So we should love for our brother that which we love out of goodness. Just like you like to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you like to pray, read the kitab of Allah, fast, memorize the kitab of Allah, attend classes, everything of good, of the dunya and the hereafter, that you love for yourself, you should also love for your brother. And that is a sign of iman. That is a sign of a person's iman. To the extent that a person can reach perfection whereby they want, their brother to be better than them. They can reach a state of perfection where they want their brother to be better than them. 
and they want all types of goodness for their brother even before themselves so that shows that a Muslim should want good for his brother and this is one of those hadith that show us the importance of a strong brotherhood between brothers and sisters between Muslims and in so many hadith the Prophet وسلم, encouraged us to be gentle to one another, to love one another, to not backbite one another, to not be harsh to one another. In a hadith that we shall see towards the end of the book, لا تحاسدوا ولا تناجشوا The Prophet وسلم, mentioned so many things to the extent that even when you want to buy something, if your brother wants to buy it before you, do not buy it. If your brother is selling something to a person, do not come out and say, listen, I sell it, I'll sell it to you for a better price. If your brother is talking to a certain sister for marriage, then it is not from brotherhood and sincerity and advice to one another for you to go and start to talk to that sister and vice versa. So these are things that damage brotherhood. Like in this hadith and other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, these are things that create one ummah. That's why, the Prophet, that's why Allah says, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Ikhwa. And the, the bond of brotherhood, the brotherhood of Islam, is the strongest form of bond between any two human beings. The strongest form of connection among human beings is that of the religion. Because that is the one that doesn't die. That is the one that doesn't end with death. That is the one that leads to Jannah. Because if you look, when the Messenger وسلم, and many of his companions were fighting the Quraysh, who kicked them out from Mad Mecca in Badr, there were people in the line of the Muslims, in the, in the side of the Muslims, that were fighting their fathers, their brothers, their brothers-in-laws, their cousins and so on. So what would cause a person to fight his family members? Iman. Iman is what would cause them to uh, to fight their family members. The Iman that they have in their heart that connects them to the people that are standing next to them and not the people that are on the on the other side. طيب. So where the Prophet وسلم, said, Hatta yuhibba li ma yuhibbu li nafsi. Until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. That shows that the heart of that person is what? Is clean. It is a sound heart. Because shaitan loves for there to be rifts and disputes among Muslims. That's why in a hadith the Prophet ﷺ said the shaitan has despaired from being worshipped or other than Allah being worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. Lakin he will continue to stir and cause rifts and problems between believers and between the believers <coughs> so that is the rough or a rough explanation of this hadith. Where the Prophet says, La yu'min one of you will not truly believe. You can either carry it on two means with two means. Meaning you will not have any belief, meaning the one that doesn't want for his brother is not even a Muslim, and he doesn't have the asal, the foundations of Iman. And another meaning that we could possibly take it to be is that he will not have complete iman or his iman is not perfect and his iman is deficient. And the second interpretation is more correct in this hadith. Like in that siyaq or la yu'minu or la salata it has any of those two meanings. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said la nikaha illa bi wali. There is no nikah except with a wali, except with a guardian. The woman has to have a guardian. So that hadith means, la here, means that that nikah is incorrect. It is invalid. Like in here, what it means is that this person's iman is not complete and he still has deficiencies or he has deficiencies in him if they don't want for their brother that which they love. And want for themselves. طيب. Also, the fact that you want good for your brother, it doesn't negate the fact that uh, Muslims should hasten towards good deeds. Uh, 
to have tanafus or to compete in good deeds, it doesn't mean that you don't want good for your brother. So for example, if you say to your friend or another brother that you memorize in the Quran with, let's see who memorized this X amount of Jews first. This doesn't mean that you don't love for your brother that which you don't love for yourself. Why? Because the Salaf would normally compete against one another in goodness. So for example, we have Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and, Abu, and Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar would always try to be better than Abu Bakr. Not better than him in terms of dunya, like he would try to get more reward than him. Try to get more good deeds into his account of deeds than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. To the extent that one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the companions to give sadaqah for a group of people. And then Abu Bakr, Umar said radiallahu anhu, right, today... No one's gonna, Abu Bakr is not gonna beat me. He didn't think about anyone else. He said, No one's gonna beat me. He said, Abu Bakr is not gonna beat me, Afwan. So he bought, uh, uh, he bought Abu Bakr, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, bought half of his wealth, thinking that you can't get any better than half. I'm literally giving every, half of what I have as sadaqah. Abu Bakr can't beat me. Then Abu Bakr came radiallahu anhu, and Abu Bakr brought all of, brought all of his wealth. Then on that day, Abu Umar knew that he could not compete with uh, he could not compete with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Also, another hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Verily tomorrow, when they were going to Khaybar for jihad, he said, "Verily tomorrow, I will give the banner of jihad to a person who loves Allah and His Messenger, and Allah and His Messenger love him." So the Messenger said to the companions, "Tomorrow you are going to jihad." And the banner of jihad, the emir, the leader of that jihad, is a person or will be a person. I'm going to give it to a person who loves Allah and his messenger. And Allah and his messenger love him. So that whole night, the companions did not sleep because every single one of them was invoking, making dua, wanting them to be, every companion wanting him to be the one who the messenger is going to give the banner to tomorrow. And then when the uh, Umar radiallahu anhu said that he did not love to be given leadership or to be given that responsibility except on that day. And the reason is not because they wanted responsibility or leadership. It is because of what? The fact that Allah and his messenger love him, that person. And then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in the morning, he asked for Ali radiallahu anhu to be brought to him. Tayyip. Uh, the next hadith al hadith al ashar an ibn mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yahillu damu min muslim illa bi ihda thalath al thayyib al zani wal nafs bin nafs al tarik li dinihi al mufariq lil jama'a rawahu al bukhari wa muslim this hadith narrated by abdullah ibn mas'ud radiyallahu anhu what number hadith did Abu Abdullah bin Mas'ud narrate? Hadith number four. What was the kunya of Abdullah bin Mas'ud? Uh, Abu Abdurrahman. Abu Abdurrahman. So he said, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith, in summary, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is telling us that the blood of the Muslim is sacred. Except in three scenarios or three such situations. And then he's going to name, when he mentions these three situations. So where the Prophet says, لا يحل دم مرء مسلم إلا بإحدى الثلاث The blood of one of you is not halal to be spilt except in three Except one of three scenarios. Not all these scenarios have to be in the same person. Like in one of any one of these three characteristics or traits. This hadith has, I think we've studied it before, where Islam came to preserve five things. Islam came to preserve five things. What are they? A deen, the religion. Lineage, your honor. Well, uh, huh? Honor, honor. Okay, two. Wealth. Aql, excellent. Your intellect. And life. 
and the life of a person. This hadith mentions three of those. The Prophet ﷺ mentions three of those. So for example, حفظ الدين لا يحل الدم مسلم First and foremost, it is haram to kill another Muslim. Unjustly. The Prophet ﷺ said, أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله. I have been commanded to fight the people until they say La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. We yuqimu salah until they establish the prayer and the zakah and they pay the zakah. فَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ If they do that, meaning they bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, meaning they come into Islam, then their wealth and their blood is sacred. Also the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَاضَكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا The Prophet ﷺ said, فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا The Prophet ﷺ said, Your wealth and your blood and your honor is haram upon one of you. Meaning it is sacred. And it is not permissible for a person to transgress against any of these. Just like this day is sacred. The day of Hajj. In this country, which is, or in this land, which is the what? Mecca. Which is the la- which is Mecca, in the Shahar of the Hijjah, which is one of the four uh, sacred months. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that also the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that the spilling of the blood of the Muslim is more serious than the Kaaba, or more honourable than the Kaaba. So killing an innocent Muslim is haram, and with regards to that. People are of five types. We're going to get to the hadith. We're going to get to the hadith. The, the people are of four or five types. Five types. First and foremost, the Muslim, the upright Muslim, ظاهراً وباطلاً, inward and outward, the person who is a Muslim. The one who is a Muslim, inside and outside. His blood is sacred. Why? Because he is mentioned in many of these ahadith. He is the Muslim whose blood has been preserved. Then there's the Muslim who is a believer. Outwardly, like an inwardly, he's a hypocrite. So there's the hypocrite. Deep down inside, he's not a Muslim and you can often tell by the way he acts and conducts himself and what he says and how he goes against the the commandments of Allah Jalla wa'ala. However, that person is to be treated as a Muslim since he's what? Outward appearance is what? Is a Muslim. And he says, La ilaha muhammadun Rasulullah. And he hasn't obviously come with something which is a naqid or a nullifier from the nullifiers of Islam. So that second person is what? Huh? A hypocrite? Like him. Do we know he's a hypocrite? No, we don't know. We treat him exactly how we treat the Muslim. Is understood. And then the third is, or the third type is a non-Muslim. So there are three types. The third type is a non-Muslim. However, where you've written down non, where you've written down non-Muslim, right times two. There are two types of non-Muslims. There are two types of non-Muslims. The first is al-kafir al-harbi. That the first person is the non-Muslim who is at war with the Muslims. He's a Harb, Harbi. He's in jihad against the Muslims. He's fighting against the Muslims. That one, his blood is not sacred. Why? Because he's obviously at war against the Muslims. And that is often talked about in jihad. 
the jihad that is correct, that has its conditions and so on. The second type of non-Muslim is the non-combatant, as they say, or the non-hagbi, the one who is not involved in warfare against Muslims or jihad against Muslims. And they are of three types. And they are of three types. Number one, a mu'ahad. A mu'ahad. And the mu'ahad is the one who has an agreement with the Muslims <laughs> A contract, an agreement with the Muslims in which they, he will not fight them and they will not fight them and then they've got agreements, political arrangements and so on. So he can go to the lands of the Muslims and they can go to, or the other people can go to his lands. That is the mu'ahad. That's number one. The second is the musta'man. Al Mustaman. And remind me to mention why it's important to know these differences. Al Mustaman is the second type, and he is the one who a Muslim has given security to. Any Muslim, male, female, old, young, practicing, non practicing. So a Muslim takes him under his wing and says, I am going to protect you. And there's a hadith where Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to kill a, a person, a non-Muslim, and I believe it was Umhani or one of the female companions. She gave him security and said that verily he is under my oath. I'm going to protect him. And then... Ali radiallahu anhu did not kill him because obviously he knew that that person was under the protection of this person or this Muslim person. That's the musta'man. The third is the dhimmi. A dhimmi. And the dhimmi is the person, the non-Muslim who agrees to live amongst the Mus among the Muslims and abide by the rulings of the Muslims and the, the governing of the Muslims and the rules of the Muslims and their sharia and he agrees to live under them. And they are often known as those that pay jizya, those that pay jizya to live among the Muslims. And these three it is impermissible for a Muslim to kill them. These three, it is impermissible, haram, for a Muslim to kill them. And a person can't say, listen, they're kufar. They don't say, la ilaha illallah, I'm going to kill them. La. It is haram to kill them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man qatala mu'ahidan, mu'ahidan, لم يرح رائحة الجنة. Whomsoever kills a mu'ahad, any one of these three, then he will not smell the fragrance, the scent of Jannah. And if he won't smell the fragrance of Jannah, it means that he will not be anywhere near Jannah. And that shows that it is a major sin. For those students that have their hands up, if it's any questions, delay it to the end, inshallah. Write your questions down and ask at the end. So it is impermissible. So for example, this is important to know because there are extremists who live among the Muslims, sometimes live among the non-Muslims and believe it is halal to kill the non-Muslims. And this couldn't be further from the truth. So these sorts of people, these three, it is impermissible to kill them, to harm them, to take their wealth, 
when they're living in the lands of the Muslims. And you can't simply say they are kuffar, so what? And anyone that does so, that harms them, may be killed or may be imprisoned. That's for the person, those people that are living in the lands of the Muslims. As for us, living among the non-Muslims, the same rule applies for us. It is haram to kill them, to harm them, to do anything that will cause them inconvenience, and to rob them and so on. All of that is haram, it is impermissible, because... As citizens of this land, we agree to abide by a set or a certain amount of rules. And we have to abide by those rules. And the Muslim is not a person who breaks his oath. <coughs> Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, I believe it was, and his father. Hudayfa, I'm sure it was. Just before the Battle of Badr, the Prophet sent him to the people of Makkah to see what was going around them, what they were planning to do. Anyhow, one of them noticed who Abu Hudayfa was, and I believe he wanted to kill him. Like in, he said to Hudayfa, or the agreement that him and Hudayfa had was that he Hudayfa radiallahu anhu would not fight against them. So they had that agreement, and he left him alone. Hudayfa went back to Medina. When he informed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said to him, "Oh, kama qal, fulfill your promise, and we will seek the help of Allah against them." So he did not say Hudayfa. It was a promise you made to the kuffar. You don't have to abide by. It. Let's go jihad. We're going jihad. Like he said to him, "Remain, and we shall seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa taala with them." And this is a refutation, and it shows you the innovation and the misguidance of those people who kill innocent people. Whether they blow them up on trains, whether they uh, blow them up in shopping centers or in public places, or whether they harm them in any other way, it shows that what they're doing is not from Islam. And it's important that you, Shabab, you youngsters, <coughs> are aware of this. And don't be fooled by the fact that they are saying that the Muslims are getting killed here and the Muslims are getting killed there and so on and so forth. Why? Because the Muslim is a person who abides by the Sharia of Islam. And the Muslim is not known for treachery. And the Muslim is not known for breaking their promise. So it is important that you understand that these extremists, they do exist, wherever they may be. They are, the correct terminology for them is that they are khawarij. And it's important that you stay away from them. And even if they claim to be a dola or a Islamic state, that is not how Islamic state is built. Rather, that is how CIA builds a Islamic, so-called Islamic state. There's a difference between the state of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the khilafah that the Prophet established sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the so-called khilafah that the FBI and the CIA established. There's a big difference. So these are the sorts of people that can be mentioned in this hadith lakin, or that can be benefited from this lakin. What is being referred to is the Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the blood of the Muslim is not halal, meaning it is haram to kill the Muslim, except in one of these scenarios. And if any of these scenarios happen, then it is wajib for this person or these people to be killed. However, it's worth noting that write a title who carries out these capital punishments. Who carries out these capital punishments? The answer is the leader of the Muslims or the leader of the country is the or, or anyone who is in his place that he has given the responsibility to for example the courts the 
they are the ones that are allowed to carry out these punishments. And it is not permissible for the common people to carry out capital punishments. Because if everybody decides to be the governor and says, I'm going to carry out these killings or I'm going to be the one that cut it, cuts, the, cuts the hands off the thief or I'm going to be the one that whoever leaves the village, I'm going to be the one to stone him and so on. You will find that any two people that have an argument, the other one will stone the other one or shoot them and say, nah, they were Catholic anyway, they, they insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam. Also, from the harms that comes about with people taking the law into their own hands, is that if a person, even for argument's sake, let's say a person apostates, as we shall see in this hadith, even if a person does apostate, if you now say, I'm going to carry that out on my own, and I'm going to punish him, because that is what Allah has legislated, when you do so, his family members and his friends are going to say, you know, Khalas, you killed him, we're going to kill you. They're not going to say to you, right, he done a kufr, uh, he done an act of disbelief and you're allowed to do it and so on. No. They will say, we're going to get revenge. Whereas if it's the leader that does it and it goes through a process where the courts of justice of Islam carry out these punishments, then who are they going to try to get their right from? Also, they'll be reassured that it wasn't some sort of cowboy operation. They'll know that it went through the process of being sifted out to see if a person actually done the crime or not. And they'll know it wasn't something personal because there's no connection between uh, the governor or the ruler, the leader and the common folk. There's nothing personal that can be between them. Therefore, it's important to know that the one that carries out these acts is the leader. The Imam طيب. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said إِلَّا بِحْدَ الثَّلَاثِ الثَّيِّبُ الزَّانِ The very first one is الثَّيِّبُ الزَّانِ وَالنَّفْسُ بِالنَّفْسِ وَتَارِقُ لِدِينِهِ الْمُفَارِقُ الْجَمَعَةِ So the first one الثَّيِّبُ الزَّانِ First and foremost, right? Who is a thayyib? Who is the thayyib, thayyib that is being referred to in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ says it is permissible to kill? And the answer is the one who is being referred to in this hadith, a thayyibu zani, means a person who has been married before or is married. A person who has been married or is married and has had intercourse with his wife. A person who has been married in a nikah that is correct or is still married in a nikah that is correct who has had intercourse with his wife that is the sort of person that, that is the person that the Prophet وسلم, is referring to when he says al-thayyibu zani and that is the punishment for zina. So the punishment for zina. Go on. Well, obviously, no one else's wife, isn't it? Well, yeah, no, 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 because you're saying zina, so I'm just, 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 a woman that is not halal for him. That is fornication. Fornication, zina, 
is when a person has intercourse with a woman who is not halal for him. Like in the, the definition that I'm getting at is the person, Jazakallah for mentioning it because, because it, there might have been some confusion. Like in the person who is a thayyib, a thayyib a zani that has been referred to in the hadith is a person that has been married before. That commits intercourse or adultery. The person who is either married now or has been married that commits intercourse or adultery, commits intercourse, commits zina. He is the one that the hadith is referring to. So there's two things that you need to know. You already know. Uh, so first and foremost Zina is what you already know صح? طيب لكن a person doesn't get killed for Zina alone just for committing Zina he has to fit the bill for committing zina, for being killed so where the Prophet says الثيبو الزاني the one who gets killed for his Zina is a person who is married or has been married in the past. So he, does, he could have divorced her 20 years ago. He could have divorced his wife 20 years ago. And he's not even married now. Lakin he's still called a thayyib. Or the muhsin. The person who has been through marriage or is married now. That has already had intercourse with, with his wife correctly. If he commits zina then he is the one that is to be killed. Is that understood first and foremost? Mm-hmm. So that is the one that the Prophet ﷺ is referring to. And the way he is to be killed is that he needs to be, he is to be stoned to death. He is to be stoned to death. And a group of people have to witness this act. A group of people need to witness him being punished. And we can't use any other method to kill him. Not by shooting him. Not by using a sword. Rather stoning him to death. The next title. How do we establish... If a person has fallen into zina, fornication. So the title is, how do we establish a person has fallen into zina, i.e. fornication. The first way, or there are two ways, there are only two ways. The first is that this person comes and acknowledges it. So he comes to the court and he says, billah, that he has done the act. So he acknowledges it. And this happened several times during the time of the Prophet wasallam, where people would come to the Prophet wasallam and, and acknowledge that they have committed this act then the punishment would be carried out after the Prophet ﷺ would make sure that it actually did take place by asking them again and again. So what is the first way of establishing this? If a person acknowledges it. The second way of this being established is if there are four witnesses. If there are four Witnesses. And those four witnesses have to see and witness these two people in the act. These four witnesses have to see 
these two people in the act. And it doesn't stop there. They have to witness the private parts entering into one another. They have to witness the private parts entering into one another. And everything that they tell and they mention in their testimony has to match. So they have to agree on who it was, the two people, where they were, the day, the time, they have to agree on that. However, if they don't, then they will be lashed. So for example, if one says they were in London and another says they were in another city, or if two say they were in London when they were doing this act and we witnessed it, and the other two say they were in another city, for example, or another country, then their testimony is not accepted and they are to be lashed for defaming a Muslim. One may ask, why has the Sharia made it almost impossible for this to happen? Because what is the punishment? Death. And death is not a joke. Death is not something that can be taken lightly. Therefore, we have to be 110% sure before carrying this out. Like, and if a person comes and acknowledges it himself, then there's no need to make sure now. We just have to make sure he's not drunk or he's not uh, intoxicated or he's not a person who's mentally not, not well. Like, and if a person who is well acknowledges this then he wants to be purified from this sin and it is worth noting that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he mentions he died 728 after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam almost 700-800 years ago he said up to this minute now that sort of uh, act or zina has not been established by way of four witnesses it has not happened so in the history of Islam, it has not happened. Why? Because it is what? Almost impossible. It is almost impossible. And if a person says, I saw someone do that, if they don't have four witnesses, they are to be lashed 80 times. So these are the two ways that zina is established. Taib. Also, a thayyib zani is who? Who is the thayyib zani that is mentioned in this hadith? The fornicator or the adulterer? Who is the adulterer? The one who has previously been married in a correct nikah. In a correct nikah. He is the one who, if he is caught or if he acknowledges, he shall be stoned. What about the person who hasn't been married? For example, someone's single. They've never been married. They've always been single. And they fall into the act. They fornicate. Their punishment is that they are to be lashed a hundred times. And they, they are to be sent away as a form of punishment. They are to be lashed a hundred times. And they are to be sent away as a form of punishment. Like in they are not to be not to be killed they are not to be killed so how many people do we have so far hmm? two what are these two uh, a thayyib and who is the thayyib a person who has previously been married whether he's married now or he's previously been married and then what 
it's consummated the marriage and he's the one, Naam, so he's the first. The second is a person who's single, who's never been married and who commits, a fun, who commits fornication with Ayyadu Billah. So the first is to be what? Stoned. If, if we have four witnesses who uh, bear testimony, bear witness that they've seen the five of us enter into one another and their testimonies match. Or the second way of establishing it is what? If the person acknowledges it. If the person acknowledges it. طيب. And the second type of person is what? A person who is single, who fornicates, بالله, what is his punishment? He is to be lashed and punished. طيب. The third person is the gay person or the homosexual. So this is the third type that the scholars talk about in explaining these sorts of masail. And more specifically, the two men is what is being referred to here. So their punishment is that they are to be killed. And this is the consensus of the companions and this is just as a disclaimer this is Islamic law and it's mentioned in every single book and we're not going to kill anyone over where we are but this is Islamic law just like you will find the same in Judaism and in Christianity whether it is practiced or not is something else like in this is the law of Islam. So their punishment is what? They are to be killed. And that is a consensus among their companions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Never rush. I'm getting to that point. Never rush. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Man wajadtumuhu ya'malu عَمَلَ قَوْمِ لُوطِ فَقْتُلُوا الْفَاعِلَ وَالْمَفْعُولَ بِهِ Anyone who you find doing the act of the people of Lord, then kill both parties, kill both people. طيب The only thing that the scholars of Islam differ over is how they are to be killed. The only thing that they differ over is how they are to be killed. And I'm sure if you do a quick Google search, you can find the ways that they are to be killed. Don't want to get any deeper into the wall. <laughs> yeah. The fourth type of people are women what is referred to as lesbians and in Arabic it's called as-sihaq as-sihaq and they are to be punished but not killed imprisoned or whatever it may be that's up to the imam the qadi the judge Lakin, they are not to be killed because of a punishment or as a punishment for the crime that they've committed. Two points. First and foremost, why has Islam prohibited this? First or before that and after that, Islam came to preserve the honor of the people. And it came to preserve life. And in any of the legislations of Islam, you will find that it is the best form of legislation that is suitable for the creation. And when people contradict these creations, or the, 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 when they contradict the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are trialed and tested with all forms of diseases and illnesses. 
And the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith that when the people start to indulge in their desires and so on, they will be tested with illnesses that were not within among their forefathers. And these sorts of things are common sense because if a person is born in wedlock to a couple who are married and they have a child, that child belongs to who? Belongs to them. Takes the lineage of who? Of the father. Lacking if they are born out of wedlock and those children have not or their parents are not married then that child is not does not take the lineage of their father they do not inherit them and if everyone was to do that who would end up knowing anyone we wouldn't end up knowing anyone a person can end up marrying his family members that's why Islam has legislated nikah and even among the Arabs before Islam nikah was something that was normal it was practiced the nikah that we are practicing today that Muslims practice today and the other people also practice it was always practiced it is something which is the norm lacking when you allow people with mental illnesses to be able to do what they want and to fulfill their desires in every which way, then you're going to get a society that is messed up that cannot tell the difference between a he and a she. In which people are cutting themselves up to look like the opposite gender. And then to normalize that. That is why Islam came to preserve the honor of the Muslim and life, it came to preserve life. Where does AIDS come from? Where does HIV come from? These sorts of illnesses, how are they transmitted? They are transmitted through fawahish more often than not. More often than not. There are some ways that it could be through needles and so on. Lacking more often than not, they are transmitted through fawahish. And our religion has preserved us from this. That's why if a Muslim abides by the Sharia of Islam, then they are preserved. For example, alcohol and all types of intoxicants and drugs, why are they haram? Because it causes the person to lose consciousness. It causes the person to be intoxicated. And what happens when a person is intoxicated? Hmm? They put, him, they put themselves and others in danger. They can do what they want. Anything that they want, they, could, they can throw themselves in the train tracks. They can have intercourse with their parents. They can throw other people on the train, onto the train tracks. Literally anything, because they don't know what they're doing. Like in our sharia, because it is a complete sharia, Allah Jalla wa ala has prohibited this. طيب. Another question that may be asked is, what if... Obviously, at the beginning, we said the only people, person that can carry these punishments out is what? The leader. A person can say, what about a person? <coughs> if a person <coughs> finds himself in that situation after committing this act and no one has seen him, what should he do? The answer is that he should <coughs> repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to expose himself and hide under, under the covering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that Allah jalla wa ala has not exposed him and the fact that Allah jalla wa ala has covered up his sin, he should be thankful to Allah jalla wa ala and he should repent from that sin and he should never do it again. And he should avoid everything and anything that can lead him to doing that sin again. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَهُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Allah Jalla wa ala prays those who look after their private parts. So anything that can lead to that act, they avoid. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Do not go near zina. 
Allah did not say, Wala tafalu zina, do not do zina. And there's a difference between not doing a thing, an act, and not even going near it. To avoid everything that can lead to the act is what is compulsory upon the Muslim. Tayyip. The next person that the Prophet sallam, said, I say, was only one nafsu bin nafs. One nafsu bin nafs. Or life for life. Qisas. Where a person kills another person. Where a person kills another person intentionally whilst oppressing them. And it's important to know that Killing is of three types Killing is of three types Qatlul amdi Wal udwan Qatlul amdi wal udwan A person Kills another person Intentionally and incorrectly, meaning by way of oppressing them. For example, two people have a dispute over anything, over something, and then one of them pulls out a gun and he shoots the other person. That is the first type. So they've done it intentionally, and it was by way of what? Oppression. That is the one that is being referred to this had in this hadith and in all of the verses that talk about Qisas. The verses that talk about Qisas, life for life, that is the type that is being referred to. What is it? When a person intentionally kills another person. Huh? Oppressively So for example Two people have a dispute Over a car for example Or a parking space And one of them pulls out a gun And shoots the other person That is when life for life comes in like, The second type is Qatlu Shibhil khata And is also referred to as Qatlu Shibhil Amd and this is when a person kills a person, kills another person without intending to kill them with something that doesn't usually kill a person. Similar to manslaughter, which is the third type we're going to get to. For example, two people have a dispute. They argue over, I don't know, let's say they argue over money. One of them punches the other person. And the other person falls down on the floor and dies. So this person, he intended to punch him, right? But he did not intend to kill him. How do we know that he did not intend to kill him? Because what he was using is not something that normally kills. Normally, when people punch one another, do they die? Obviously, if a person isn't a professional fighter, for example, a boxer, a king, normally, when normal people fight one another, they don't kill each other with one punch. Or a stick, for example. A person has a baseball bat. Maybe not a baseball. Like, and a person has a stick, and he hits the other person with that stick, and a person dies. That doesn't normally happen. Even with a baseball bat, sometimes a person may break his arm, like in, more often than they don't, they don't die from it. 
So that second type is when a person intends to harm the person, like and they don't intend to kill the person because they are using something that doesn't normally kill. That type is not does not come under life for life. Does not come under this hadith. What is that type? Who can summarize it? That second type of killing. An accidental killing, okay, but he intended to kill the person. He, no, Afwan, he intended to harm the person, but not to kill the person. And what he was using is something that doesn't usually kill a person. The third type is accidental killing. Accidental killing. The third type is an accidental way of killing. For example, a person might be hunting. He's hunting. He's in a forest. He's hunting. Obviously, a person is allowed to what? Hunt. And he's got his shotgun. So he's hunting for the, these rainbow, uh, uh, these or the uh, the rabbits and so on. Type. Type. And he shoots at the target. Lacking, he accidentally hits a human being. Or he's dri- a person is driving and then someone runs onto the road. They hit them and that person dies. That is called Qatlul Khatra accidental killing or manslaughter. So this person. Not only did he not intend to kill him, but he didn't even intend to what? Harm him. Again, that type doesn't come under this hadith. That type doesn't come under this hadith. Go on. Qatlul khata. Khata. Mistake. A person makes a mistake. So he did not intend to kill him, like he accidentally killed him. He did not intend to even harm him, like and he accidentally harmed him and killed him. Again, that is not being referred to in this hadith. Go on. You know how you mentioned uh, an example of that, let's say someone runs out onto the road and they run them over. But that's a complete accident. What if someone is being negligent in the fact that they do something which could kill, they, don't, they didn't mean to kill, but they were doing something, I'm sure you know what I mean. Yeah, questions after, inshallah. Just write them down so you don't forget, and questions after. Tayyib. So these are the three types of killings that are found in the books of fiqh. Lakin, however, the killing that is being referred to now, where the sheikh says, a nafs bin nafs, a soul is killed for a soul, is what? Referring to who? The person that kills another person intentionally. Huh? Whilst يعني, oppressing him That obviously takes out what? If a person, مثلا, if he works at the court مثلا, he work, He's the person that carries out the capital punishment He's brought 10 criminals every day and he kills them Is he to be killed? But he's intentionally killing them huh? But he's not oppressing them Or, or if a person comes into your home, wants to kill you, and you kill them. You intend to kill them, but what? Is that oppressing him? No, yeah. nah, it's self-defense. It is self-defense. Taib. The next mas'ala is, now that we've established what sort of death, or what sort of killing necessitates life for life, or the capital punishment, the next is, uh, the people that, the killer, and the one that is being killed. The killer or the one that has been killed. They have to be on the same religion. For example, a Muslim is killed for a Muslim. A Muslim is killed for a Muslim. If a Muslim kills another Muslim, he is killed for it. What do you understand from that? What? Now, if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, they are not killed for it as qisas. 
Pay attention. They are not killed for it as qisas. As the capital punishment, life for life. They may be killed for other reasons. As a form of punishment. And they will get they will obviously <coughs> get punished. As for how they get punished, that is up to the, the hakim, the judge. So that is the first condition that they have to be on the same religion, meaning Muslim for a Muslim. Or a non-Muslim for a non-Muslim. If a non-Muslim kills a non-Muslim, then they are what? Because they are the same religion. So a non-Muslim kills a non-Muslim, he is to be what? Killed. What if a non-Muslim kills a Muslim? Non-Muslim kills a Muslim, he is to be killed. If a non-Muslim kills a non-Muslim, um, kills a Muslim, he is to be killed. So that is the first condition. The second is in terms of the scholars mention, they have to be both, or they both have to be free people. One of them cannot be a slave. If the maqtool is the one that, if the one that is killed is a slave, then the free person is not killed, according to many of the scholars. <coughs> and then there are those that say that he is to be killed for the Muslim slave. طيب. The next mas'ala that the scholars mention is <coughs> Can a father If a father kills his son What happens? What should they do? Should we carry out Qisas or not? What do you think? If a father You have Ali And you have a son called Ahmed Ali the father Kills Ahmed Should we carry out the Qisas on Ali, the father, what do you think? Um, this was taken to the court and used in the Both Muslims. Um, this was taken to the court. Taken to the court, we've given him to the court. What happens? Well, what, what would you say? Kills, not killed, what? Yeah, since, they're both, <coughs> huh? since they're both Muslims. Since they're both Muslims? Um, they He's dead. How can you take retribution? Huh? <coughs> The family, meaning siblings, in there, or the mother, taking or oh, uh, killing husband. Time is the father to be killed for killing his son. The father is above the son. Okay, so so the brother said no because the father is above the son. Taking a life is oppression, even if it is a son. So take. So you're saying he should be killed yes. because taking a life is life. Qisas is Qisas, killing is killing. In the, the hadith is unrestricted, so it doesn't mention a specific, specificity. But if there is another delay, then. So the hadith says, When nafs bin, <coughs> when nafs bin nafs, it is general, a soul for a soul or a life for a life. If they were upon the same religion, then yes. Taib? Shouldn't it be the choice of family is it's blood money or Qisas? The only problem that you have here is that the father would normally be the one yeah. that is the f next in line. So he's killed his next in line. That's, that's, that's the pickle, that the dilemma we find ourselves in. The next in line. The other sons. They, the other sons are not even entitled to inherit if the father is there. But the problem we have here is the father has killed. Can he inherit first and foremost, Adha Hakim? He can't inherit. Daib. The majority of scholars say that if a father kills his son, he's not to be his child, he's not to be killed for him. Because the Prophet وسلم, said a child a father is not killed for his child. So those scholars that say that that hadith is authentic, then they say if a father kills his son or parent kills their child, then they are not to be killed. And from the reasons they mention is because they say that the parent was a reason, the father was a reason for him to come into the dunya. Therefore, he can't be a reason for him exiting the dunya. The child can't be the reason for the father exiting the dunya. Because obviously, if we kill the father, that's him going to the akhirah. So they say, the father is the reason for the child to be in the dunya in the first place. So if we kill the father, then the child is now not repaying that favor back. Rather, he's doing the complete opposite, which is he's, killing, he's the reason for the child being killed, for his father to be killed. 
لكن others say لا he's not the one the in reality the child hasn't killed him the father has killed himself طيب so that is just one of the messiah that is talked about طيب what if a person questions after what if a person do you know as a form of punishment I might not actually give you question and answers today mm. طيب um, طيب if a person the next مسألة and you might use the title available options when a person is killed what options does a person have available to him when his family member is killed the first is قصاص he can order for this person to be killed he can ask for this person to be killed the second is he can take a diya which is blood money the second is a diya and he can take blood money And the third option is Al-Afu. He can forgive. فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ فَاتِّبَاعٌ بِالْمَعْوُفِ So the third option is that he can forgive. Is that he can forgive. So these are the three options available for a person when their family member is killed. طيب Which of the five darurat al-khams, the five things that Islam came to preserve, which one does this preserve? Life. Because, also this shows the wisdom behind the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we say to a person, if we say to the people, if you kill a person, you will be killed. That is more than, a, that's more than enough as a deterrent for them not to kill one another. That's why the safest countries in the world are those countries that the sharia of Allah is what? Is practiced. You can go from Riyadh to Mecca, a thousand kilometers, on your own, and you won't fear anything but the dark. You won't fear anything. You can, as I've mentioned before, you can go to the ATM machine at 2 a.m. in the morning. You won't have to look over your shoulder. Like in here, as I mentioned last time, 3 p.m. you look over your shoulder. So that is the wisdom whereby people, you, when Allah says, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ In Qisas, there is life for you. Why? Because if a person kills another person and he is killed and he's left hanging somewhere for people to see, Everyone else will think, I'm not going to kill anyone, otherwise that's what's going to happen to me. And that's why the justice system in the West is a joke. Because a person kills another person, he's given 20 years, he serves 10 and he's out. As if nothing's happened. خلاص. And more often than not what happens is, they carry on doing what they were doing even before being imprisoned. Like in the justice of the Sharia and the wisdom of the Sharia, shows that you've put a total end to it. Anyone that kills, gets killed. Anyone that harms another person, they get, they get harmed. If a person takes the eye of another person, their eye gets taken out. If they cut off the hand of a person, their hand gets cut off. That's the only way that works with human beings. That is the only way that works with human beings. And if you don't believe that, go and look into any media outlet. Read the number of crimes that are going on in London alone. Rather in East London alone. Some crazy, horrific crimes where a father would kill his children. Or he'd kill his wife, he'd strangle her to death and nothing happens. He's in prison, given 20 years. He's eating, he's going to the gym, he's learning in prison. Khalas. When he comes out, mashallah. Tayyip. <laughs> <laughs> And how is that fair for the people whose daughter, whose sister has been killed, or whose brother has been killed? Obviously, it's not fair. طيب. The next is, the Prophet ﷺ says, 
The third type of person is the one who leaves his religion and he apostates from the religion of Islam. The one who leaves his religion, i.e. Islam. The religion that is being referred to is Islam. The religion of haqq, truth. So the person that apostates, their punishment is that they are to be killed. Lakin, first and foremost, they are told to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to retake the shahada. And if they don't, then they are to be, to be killed. Like in who is the one that carries out this? Carries this out? The leader. And it has to be carried out in a mahkama, in a, in a Muslim court. So we can't do that here. We can't apply this here. This is where you require fiqh understanding in the sharia. If you see a person who has apostated, you can't just go and chop their head off. You can't kill them. Also, they label themselves as an ex-Muslim. That terminology is incorrect. They are an apostate. Ex-Muslim. There's no such thing. There's ex-partner, ex-husbands, things like that. But there's no such thing as an ex-Muslim. That person is an apostate. And in terms of religion, that person is worse than the person who is a Christian or Jew to us. Because the person from the people of the book, we can eat their food. Muslim men can marry their women, lacking the apostate. You can't eat his food, nor can you marry his uh, any of his if anyone that's like that, anyone that is similar to him. So this preserves the religion of the Muslims. Because if if everyone disbelieves, if everyone disbelieves, then people are going to take the religion to be a laughing stock. And the religion of Islam is not a laughing stock. It is the last standing religion on the face of the earth that actually stands for something. It is the only religion that has not been tampered with. It is the only religion that cannot be changed. Although people are trying to change it every single day and every single night, like it is impossible to change the religion of Islam because you've got Muslims that are ready to stand up for their religion, to learn their religion, and to spread their religion. That's why in every single masjid and every single Islamic center you have a madrasa. Sah or Allah? Sah? Every single institute, whether it's a masjid, whether it's a makas, has a madrasa. That madrasa concentrates on what? Teaching the coming generations about Islam. And that shows, or that gives us, puts the, makes the burden of responsibility even greater upon us, especially living in these lands. The only way that Islam can be changed is if we let Islam down. And if we let Islam down, then Allah Jalla wa ala will bring a people who will uphold the values and the traditions of Al Islam. So that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Al al mufariqul al jamaa is the person who leaves off the jamaa, Leaves off the main body of the Muslims, the mainstream body of the Muslims. And anyone that apostates has left the mainstream body of the Muslims. That's why that sort of person is not to be talked to, not to be debated. And even when you're giving them da'wah, give them da'wah on al-Islam first. Give them da'wah on the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Because a lot of apostates, you will find that they have issues with the hijab. So they probably disbelieve because they want to flaunt their beauty and they don't want to wear the hijab. Or they want to do what they want as they please and they don't want to abide by the rules and regulations that Islam has placed. So they want to live, to roam like animals. So their problem stems from the fact that they have not submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does Islam mean? Al-istislamu lillahi bi tawheed. So even if you're arguing with a person or talking to a person, giving da'wah to a person who has got issues with the hijab, don't talk to them about the hijab. It's a waste of time. 
if they say to you, why are Muslim men allowed to marry four women? خلاص, don't bother talking to them about why Muslim men are allowed to marry four women. Because their problem doesn't lie in the fact that they're allowed to marry four women or a hundred women. It doesn't lie in that. It doesn't lie in the hijab. It lies in the one that has legislated the hijab, who is Allah Jalla wa'ala. That is what they've got issues with. That is what they do not believe in. So even if you give them a million different reasons why a person should wear the hijab, it makes no difference to them. So this is the third punishment that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in this hadith, which is However, it's important to also know that with regards to calling people kuffar and apostates, it is not down to the laymen or, and it is not down to the students of knowledge. This is not a responsibility that Allah has placed on your shoulders. Therefore, you should not make it your duty to call people kuffar and to say that they have apostated and so on. Because that is not the role of the Muslim, of the that is not the role of the common Muslim. That is the role of the people of knowledge. <coughs> so that is a rough explanation of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned this. Also the Prophet said, مَنْ بَدَّلَ دِينَهُ فَاقْتُلُوا Whomsoever changes their religion, فَاقْتُلُوا Then kill him. Whomsoever changes their religion, then kill them. And Islam is not a barbaric religion. It is not a bloodthirsty religion. It's a, it is a religion that has been legislated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. And he knows what rectifies the creation. Man-made laws, how often do they get changed? Almost every single day in the House of Commons or in the House of Laws, they place new legislations. However, they will change those in the near future. And then soon after that, they will change them, those, those laws that they all also put into place. Like in with Islam, from the time of the Prophet wasallam, up until now, it has been the same and it will remain the same until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Right. So we'll stop there, inshallah. And we'll carry on from the 15th hadith next week. الله تعالى أعلم وأحكم